Chapter 4. Travel to the Moon My family still ate breakfast together before we all started our daily tasks, but with so much of our food confiscated, portions were small. It was an unspoken rule that Auntie Paulina got anything extra because she was nursing Tanya. My poor little cousin seemed always hungry, so it was a good thing our you had extra milk. Often, I'd sit Tanya on my lap and cajole her into a good mood by feeding her spoonfuls of used milk thickened with kasha flour while I ignored my own grumbling stomach. Manka wasn't due to give birth until April, so we still had a few hungry weeks to wait until we had cow's milk again, not to mention butter and cheese, although what one cow produced wouldn't go far with seven mouths to feed. The chickens would start laying eggs around the same time Manka calved, but again, we only had six chickens. Even so, the possibility of more food in April was something to look forward to. Slavko helped Tato and me finish the barn, and we built a false ceiling above the rafters to hide Auntie Paulina's grain. It was good that our animals finally had a functioning barn. And once it got warmer, I was planning on sleeping out there, too. I was used to sleeping through the noises of my own family, but our house was so crowded now with cranky, hungry people that no one got a good sleep. Uncle Ilya's death had shaken all of us, he was Tato's older brother and best friend. To me, he was like a second father, but our sorrow couldn't compare with Auntie Paulina's. To lose the love of her life in such a shocking way and not be able to bury him or have the dignity of the priest's blessing affected her to the core. Our little family did the best that we could to honor Uncle Ilya. Tato made a wooden cross and carved in an intricate geometric design that looked like Auntie's embroidery. We can place it in the cemetery, said Tato. We can have our own private cemetery. Auntie Paulina clasped the cross to her chest. This is beautiful, she said. Ilya would have loved it. But I don't want to think of him in that cemetery now. It overlooks the Kolhas and our desecrated church. I don't think that would make his soul happy. It certainly does nothing for me. Where should we put it then, asked Tato. By the windmill, said Auntie Paulina. I like to imagine him looking at the river, the willow trees, and the orchards. You're right, Mama said, much better than the cemetery. Ruslana and Vera came to the tribute, and so did their father. The girls sang Vichnaya Pamyat for Uncle Ilya in their clear, strong voices, and they also sang some of the old folk songs that Auntie and Uncle had been collecting in their book. Some of my classmates attended, but not feeder. After the informal tribute was over and everyone had left, Slavko and Yulia went off to collect firewood, and Tato went to the barn to do some work. I should have followed Tato, but instead, I just stood there. Mama turned to me and said, Come inside and sit for now. You'll feel better after some tea. Auntie carried Tanya, and I followed her and Mama into the house. Mama put the kettle to warm in the pitch. Auntie Paulina sat at the kitchen table with Tanya on her lap and I slumped down beside her, stifling a sob. I loved my father so much. Yet here was this little girl who would grow up never knowing her father. It seemed so unfair. Just then there was a light tapping on our door. I opened it a crack. It was Yelena, Chort's wife, holding a dish covered with a familiar embroidered cloth. It was one that Auntie had crafted herself. I opened the door all the way. Please come in, I said. She stepped in just far enough so the door closed behind her. Vichnaya Pamyat, she said, her eyes wet with tears. May you remember Ilya Chorny always. This food, cloth, and plate are my tribute to his memory. Mama came over and took the plate from Yelena. Can you stay for tea, she asked. No, said Yelena. Chort would beat me if he realized I was here. She turned to Auntie Paulina. I am sorry that my husband killed yours and I am sorry that I live in your house. If I could turn back the clock, I would. Auntie Paulina's eyes widened, but she didn't respond. Yelena walked out. There was silence for a minute, or maybe two. Then Mama lifted the cloth from the plate and showed it to Paulina. One piece of my stitch work back, said Paulina. Mama held the plate to Paulina and then to me. Yelena had brought us apple squares, I wonder if those were made from your store of apples, I said to Auntie Paulina. She took a bite and nodded. 
Probably, she said. And that plate, she said, putting a finger on its edge, was a wedding gift. It was either thoughtful or ghoulish of her to select such personal items, I said. I think she was trying to be thoughtful, said Auntie Paulina. I certainly appreciate having these memories ba mementos back. A few nights after Uncle Ilya's tribute, we all sat around the table, digesting a particularly sparse supper. We need to escape, said Tato. There's more risk in leaving, Stefan, said Mama. Surely the government will come to its senses and realize their plan won't work. You're wrong, Michinilana, said Auntie Paulina. We need to get out of here. Where would we possibly go, said Mama? Across the Zubrik River, said Auntie Paulina, to Polish Ukraine. I have cousins in Ternopil. Maybe they could help us. That's an excellent idea, said Tato. That's so far away, said Mama. We may as well look for a way to travel to the moon. The next morning, as I walked to school, I ignored my grumbling stomach and thought about what Auntie Paulina had suggested. This collectivization seemed headed for disaster. Auntie Paulina and Tato were right. We had to get out. But the chances of getting the opportunity and means to leave seemed non-existent. I paused in front of Rosalina's house, and for a moment I forgot that she no longer lived there. She and her family had been forced onto the Kolkhoz. Now their quaint cottage had been transformed into a storage depot for confiscated goods. A soldier sat on a chair in front of the door, his eyes closed and a shotgun resting across his lap. Houses all over Filifka had been raided while we were at the village square, watching our church and priests be destroyed. Some people had been arrested and sent to slave labor camps in the north, but some people had been killed. Yulia's classmate, Irina, and her parents were gone. They had owned the general store in the village square and had been taken over by one of the shock workers. A friend of Slavko's had also vanished with his family. Had they been deported or killed? No one knew, but either way, it was terrifying. The only people who didn't get raided, arrested, or killed were the ones who had signed up to help Tupolev conduct the raids. Livestock, people, household goods, and food all vanished. People joined the Kolhas not because they wanted to, but out of necessity. Tupolev himself said, It's part of Stalin's collectivization plan. If you want to eat, join the Kolkhoz. As I walked past the village square, I could see the outline of the Kolkhoz behind it. Ruslana had told me that no one was really in charge of the day-to-day -day running of it because it was supposed to be managed cooperatively. But when people bickered, Tupolev's decisions stood. The buildings had all been completed, and nearly half the residents of Filifka had signed on. There were people milling about, and some of the horses and cows were visible in the pasture. It was odd to see so many animals together, because usually each farmer would have just one cow and one horse. I squinted to see if I could find Tachka, Auntie's distinctive black mare, but I couldn't see her. I kept my head bowed as I passed what had been our church, because it was impossible to look at the spot now without getting upset. It was terrible to think of the way that our priest and holy mother had been killed, and I wondered about Roman, too. No one in the village had seen him since the day of the attacks. Had he managed to escape? Where was he now? The only thing that remained of our church was the floor, an ancient tilework of ledger stones, flat grave markers for each of the people buried in the catacombs below it. I had checked them all out when I was younger, and the oldest was from 1690. Now, a red army cannon rested on top of our ledger stones. Ruslana was waiting outside the school for me when I got there. Here, she said, thrusting a coarse wheat bun into my hand when no one was looking. I shoved it inside my jacket. Thanks, I said. When I got home, I'd share it with my family. If Ruslana was caught giving Kolkas food to me, she'd be in big trouble. But she did it as often as she could. How are things going? Chores every waking hour, she said. Just then the bell rang, so we all filed inside. As students around me took their seats, I slid my atlas out from my desk and looked at a map of the Soviet Union and Poland. I found the Zabruch River, and close to it I found Ternopil. With my ruler, I calculated the distance almost 800 kilometers as the crow flies. 
Was it even possible to travel that far? Could we go on foot? By train? I tried to imagine Tanya making that trip. Mama was right. We may as well try to go to the moon. Comrade Petrovna looked as tired as I felt as she went up and down the aisles to give us back our essays. We were all supposed to write about one aspect of Stalin's five-year plan, and our marks were based on our enthusiasm for the ideology. In other words, we'd be rewarded for how well we lied. I had chosen the miracle of Soviet tractors at the urging of my brother, and when Comrade Petrovna placed my essay on my desk, I was pleased to see that my blustering had scored a near-perfect mark. Ruslana sat in front of me, and her mark was also excellent. She held her paper over her shoulder so I could see the topic, the Durstprom, how the Soviets invented the skyscraper. Grisha, Comrade Chort's son, sat beside me. He grinned when the teacher handed him his paper. He held it up so I could see that he got a perfect score. I angled my head to read the title of his essay, An Exhibit Proposal for the Anti-Religious Museum of Moscow. Fadir sat on my other side, and I was curious about his essay topic. Comrade Petrovna got to his desk and plopped his paper down in front of him. He flipped it over to see the mark, but his face looked stricken, and he quickly covered the mark with his hand. I had already seen it, though. A failing grade. Fadir never failed, especially not essays. He saw me angling to get a look at his topic. He scowled but held up the paper for me to see. The paper was on how to make a kolhas function more efficiently. The fact that he'd choose such a topic took courage. He was certainly braver than me. Our next subject was algebra, and as Feeder walked up to the board to show his work for a complicated equation, I stifled a yawn. He and his father still lived in their old house, which was directly across the village square. It had been fixed up with items confiscated from so-called Kulyaka, and now was one of the nicest houses in Filivka. If we were still close friends, I would have asked him how he felt about that, benefiting from other people's misfortunes. Their neighbor was Comrade Holodinya, Yulia's teacher, who was one of the first to sign up as a shock worker. After the priest and Holy Mother's murder, the other shock workers avoided pilfering from their house, almost as if they were superstitious about it. But Holodinya's wasn't bothered by that at all. She and her husband took a wheelbarrow over and emptied the house bit by bit of antique plates, rugs, books, all sorts of things that had been passed down from priest to priest for centuries. The lessons droned on, and I struggled to pay attention. But that's a hard thing to do when you're hungry and tired. Just before class ended, Comrade Petrovna said, There's a meeting tonight. This is for villagers and Kolhoznicks alike. Every family must be there.